Hi, so we're going to get started here. Uh, the webinar is Crafting APIs for Mobile Apps. I'm Marsh Gardner. Uh, I'm Earth's Marsh on Twitter, and I'm presenting today with Ed Anuff. He's Ed Anuff at on Twitter, very easy. We should mention up front that all of these webinars get recorded. We'll post them to YouTube, so if, uh, if you miss, if you have to drop during this, or if you want to share it afterwards, you can look there. We'll post that, uh, as we always do, and probably tweet about it as well. And then also, in addition to posting the videos to YouTube, we'll put up the slides on SlideShare uh, so that all this material is available to you. We have two groups that are vendor neutral, where things of interest to us and lots of others like you get discussed. One of them is API Craft, where people talk about how do we make great APIs, and the other is App Craft, uh, which started after API Craft and is uh, getting nice velocity. Um, so great conversations happening there, and if these things matter to you, you should join us and others. All right, so um, Apogee powers a bunch of big enterprise companies, such as Walgreens, Best Buy, Dell, Pearson. These are companies that use internal and external developers to create awesome products. And it, so it, out of all of these names that you picked of our customers, why did you pick these? These are all cases where the reason why these APIs were created, um, or at least the primary users of these APIs, are app developers that are turning these uh, into customer-facing user experiences. So we thought they'd be a really good starting point in terms of uh, some examples of what you have to think about when you are doing uh, APIs for mobile developers. And so on this slide, these are just screenshots. We pulled these apps off of the App Store, and we saw a really nice mix of uh, you know diverse set of apps all built against uh, against these APIs. You know, Apogee um, and others have been really talking about this app economy, and what it's really all about is this shift from building primarily sort of web-based interactions to creating your interactions for primarily mobile, but there's a whole set of different mechanisms, devices that people are gonna be using to interact with you. So we really do see this as one of the big drivers going forward and thinking about your API strategy and uh, how you build these things. So I think from the last slide, yeah, the, the big takeaway for me is that all of these APIs are it's really about mobile, right? And, and I guess that makes some sense because API, the, the A begins the be, begins the acronym, that's application, right? And applications are apps. And so really, if I read you right, you're saying that the story of mobile is the story of APIs. Well, I think it's pretty much turning out that way. And I think, I think you nailed it, which is that, you know, we've all been working on APIs, um, you know, web APIs for a long time now. And uh, it became really easy for us, I think, to get caught up in, in sort of the network technical aspects of it and to forget that, you know, these things are put in place to drive applications. And so I think that that piece is now uh, being brought back front and center. And so the interesting thing about this is that it starts to kind of change the dynamics from not being about server to server programming, but about device to server. And so, you know, one statistic that we've, we've thrown around is that there's 100 times the number of devices out there mm -hmm. that are making, uh, you know, server requests than, than, you know, number of servers. So it now is just creating a much more massive interconnect. And so when people talk about, you know, the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything, uh, it really is the Internet of APIs. Which makes some sense, given that, you know, they, they talk about revolution, revolutions in computing ending up having 10 times the install base. And so, you know, what should we expect? We should expect 10 times what we saw in the last round. Exactly. What we're talking about today is really thinking about you know some of the the architectural implications, but also sort of how are you building around this. So we see that in terms of this shift from websites to apps, that now you're seeing kind of a different model, which is how do we expose our digital assets as APIs? And you've got your developers who are creating app experiences. Now the website is essentially an app experience, even though I think in a lot of cases we've thought about it in sort of a monolithic way, but it really has been sort of the first app. And then your devices, and yes, your Chromecast, those will be all your additional app experiences, and it's all about creating these interaction points. This is where we start to get into some interesting stuff. The scale then goes up. And so, you know, these this are some of the details that different surveys and research has put out there online. 1.5 million apps in the app stores. One of the interesting statistics was that an active smartphone, of which there are about 2 billion of them, um, is opened 150 times a day. And it's not a totally far out thing there to think that, you know, every time you open your device and look at it, um, it could be, it's, it's either invoking or responding to an API request, mm -hmm. something that's triggering the reason why you went to open it up. Mm -hmm. So that means that, you know, you're looking at 300 billion API calls a day directly for servicing apps. And you know, that comes out to something like, I think, 30,000 requests per second that are just from apps, mm -hmm. the back end, which is 
pretty significant step up in you know your throughput. Yeah, that's a, I mean, those are big numbers. So when you're building this, what, why are you doing this? Well, you're trying to implement a certain set of capabilities or features. You've got requirements that are coming in for, for creating a more personalized app experience, for delivering content, social, and so on. This is really when people are sitting around saying, okay, we want to create a new app. These things get thrown up on the whiteboard. Sure. And as developers, I mean, that's all because, you know, it, mobile is apps, and, and we, we're really talking about these mini computers that sit in our pockets. They're really personal computers, and, and the context is so much richer. And, and when, when they're all these different you know, personalized data sources, you know, that's all connected through APIs. Exactly, exactly. And so then the tools for implementing that, for implementing that personalization, delivering content, creating these social interactions, and ideally sort of driving business and what have you, start to get classified as things like push notifications, which I think we've all seen has been an extremely powerful mechanism within app development. Um, geo suddenly becomes a big deal. Geolocation, querying your data based on location. Right. Not a problem that you had to deal with a, that same fine level of granularity in the past. Like searching by zip code was good enough. You know, Now it's like, okay, I'm gonna put in a precise latitude and longitude and get things back. Obviously identity um, is inherent to a personalized experience. Mm -hmm. Um, you start to see things like, okay, you know, uploading pictures and storing digital assets, things, creating a two-way experience. Um, and of course, social and the intersect and the sort of the counterpart of social, which is security. And these all become things that you somehow have to figure out how to build. And so, you know, in many ways, what you're doing is you're building your app with this set of capabilities delivered on demand. And that's the API to app story. Let's actually dig in a little bit and take a look at one really cool app that was built by one of our customers, Walgreens. Marsh, you've, uh, you've, you were experienced with this one. You've uh, sure. looked into it. Yeah, well, I mean, the Walgreens story, and they've done a lot of talking about it uh, over the last few months because you know, they've really seen an impact on engagement. And so you know, Tim McCauley, their senior director of mobile, uh, he had said that engaged customers have a higher satisfaction and spend more. And he went on to explain that you know, the customers who spend online, in-store, and via mobile, they end up spending at a level that's six times higher. And they see customer satisfaction that is way up and way higher. These are their most valuable, most important customers. Um, and, and that's all been enabled by their mobile strategy. Right. Well, from the developer side of things, um, you know, you know, you and I, we build APIs. We get called in because this is, you know, here's the concept, this great app. When we look at this, what we start to do is go and actually break this into API calls. Right. You know, and it's really interesting because you can look at these through that lens. And so in this case, you know, you've got your sign in experience and, and that's obtaining an OAuth token, right? So okay, there's one request there. Uh, you know, uploading a photo is, you know, okay, so now I know I need to have a resource right. that I'm gonna upload to. Um, if there is a payment form, as we see here, you can see that there's a coupon. Well, coupons often are like regional. Uh, they come from a third-party program. So now you're talking about like a partner API and then actually placing your order, which is, of course, you know, going to have to be transactionally safe. But again, it's an API call. And so this starts to become one of the sort of the first parts of that sort of API planning process when you're trying to design your API for an app. And even if you don't necessarily have an app in mind, specific one, it really helps when you're designing your API to start to have some use cases like this around there. And we actually have, you know, uh, some additional examples here that's planning a, a conference, um, you know, and, and that's, it seems like there's a new app each time for, for those. But again, you see the same sorts of patterns, you know, that of course sign in, uh, you know, we of course always suggest starting with OAuth. So that's why, you know, all our examples have the token request. Sure. But here we start to see a user-centric API. So if I want to see all my friends, that typical form is sort of users slash me slash friends. Um, finding a list of sessions I can attend. Being able to RSVP, that would be a post for that session. Uh, or having some activities facility or posting questions. So again, you start to see this mapping of interactions to, to API calls. Now again, it's, it's never necessarily that one-to-one, -one, but it does get the, the design process going both architecturally and on the flip side, for the people who are building the app, starts to let them think how they communicate their requirements to you. Help me understand what is it about mobile apps that I need to think about that's different than what I'm used to? Yeah, so that's a really good question. In fact, that's you know a, a conversation we have a lot because mm -hmm. in many cases, these API programs preceded um, a lot of the thinking about apps or um, a lot of times, you know, hey, I'm on the API team 
Um, I know that there's an app team that's going to be using this stuff, but they might be in the next building over. They might be a partner or, mm -hmm. you know, a digital agency or somebody. And so I'm sort of having to guess when I, I'm told, hey, I need an API to get to this. You start to have to kind of put yourself in the app developer's shoes. And you'll very quickly sort of find a set of things that are inherently different or at the very least that there's some significant nuances that you have to, to understand when you create your API or you're going to, to uh, start to get um, you know, uh, feedback from the app developers that, that you're not meeting their needs. Mm -hmm. And so this is a set of these and, and so you know, we'll, we'll dive into these um, in a little bit more depth. So the first one is architecture. How do you build the APIs? Mm -hmm. And we see that there's some different stuff. So first of all, from the app developer's perspective, they see this as a two-tier problem. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that us as API developers don't view this as maybe a three, four, N-tier problem. <laughs> because we've got, sure. but, but to the app developer, there's two tiers. There's the app and there's the back end. Right. And they're not, they're, it's just not part of their problem definition to think about all the tiers beyond that. It's all just this thing that they're calling. And often, you see that there's two teams. There's sort of, and we've spent a lot of time, Apogee, talking about the API team, the API, API team, there's now this app team that's the counterpart. And they're coming and looking at this um, in a different way. Uh, they view web, so first of all, they tend to view web as a client, not part of the monolithic stack. Mm -hmm. This tends to be a big deal for, um, particularly people using e-commerce stacks that have gone and like deeply integrated the, the storefront all the way down to the, the actual business objects and customer objects. Um, but you still see this actually, you know, uh, People who have been strongly into monolithic stack, PHP developers and so on, start to go and say, ooh, you know, I, where, where does the logic go? Where do I do this sort of thing? And, and the device has a lot more logic. Mm -hmm. And this has caused some gaps to, to open up in terms of what people use. We've seen, for example, Node.js is really popular for this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, I think you see this mobile stacks, you see Node.js and Mongo and so on um, being used to sort of quickly build these backends. Yep. And, and even faster, I'm going to skip Mystic or Thunder, but back yep. as a service. I mean, companies like Parse. Definitely. So, yeah, you've had, um, you know, this has created a gap because it's a new architecture where um, if you sort of come at it from the standpoint of saying, okay, what's this new tier, two tier architecture? One idea that, that has gained a lot of popularity is the idea of a back end as a service. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, Parse. Um, you know, has done a great job for, for, you know, the long tail app developers and startups and so on. Um, if you're doing enterprise apps, for example, Apigee has a back end as a service as well that's open source and you can use and uh, handles enterprise scale. But, but you're starting to see that, you know, you're starting to see that, that this development model, that the tools and the architecture are now mapping to this two team model. Going back to sort of, this, so this slide basically just puts it, you know, this is the world as the app developer sees it. They, they see their app code, they see their SDK, they see this API call, they sort of know what's happening, and then this server infrastructure. So when I put my, my server side development, my API architect hat on, I go and look at that, I'm like, man, I, there's a ton more stuff there on the right. But it's always important to understand what it is um, that, uh, that, you know, the people who are using your services the way that they see it. And so let's dig a little bit on, on the client side. So kicking it off, SDKs are APIs. You know, Apogee for a long time has said, um, think APIs, not SDKs. Mm -hmm. Well, we're actually gonna say the opposite now. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is because to the app developer, they think in terms of code, not calls. Mm -hmm. And when you put yourself in their shoes, they start asking, Okay, is there an SDK for this? Mm -hmm. How quickly can I get started? So, is it fair to say that in some ways an SDK is solving your last mile problem? That your API is your way of distributing all of your information as far and as wide as you can, but that you still have to get into the app? Absolutely. That's a very good analogy. And, you know, I go even further than that to go and say that um, for a lot of app developers, um, if you don't have an SDK, mm -hmm or at the very least a recommended framework for using it that's been tested, they, they'll consider your API not done. Mm -hmm. You don't have an SDK, the API is not done. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's some reasons for this. And the re big reasons for this are that a lot of the mobile development is now happening um, in static languages. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're using Android or you're using with Java or iOS with Objective-C, um, it's not as easy 
to go and deal with sort of, you know, the schemaless JSON structure or loosely typed and loosely schema defined JSON structure um, as it is in something like Python or Ruby or PHP or what have you. Um, you know, the hash table is not sort of the, the native object form for, for, for languages, you know, like Java or, or Objective-C. So if they've got a user, they need a user object, they need a user class, they need it to have predefined fields. And if you send three more elements than you, uh, than, than the new things that they don't know about, that SDK has to be designed for that, mm -hmm. or it could blow up their, their code. So that's where they start to go and say, you know what, um, we've got to ship some apps, so could you please just give me an SDK? Now, you know, HTML5 and JavaScript and things like PhoneGap are, are, are you know, starting to bring that perspective back. Mm -hmm. So now you do have dynamic, um, you know, programming and JavaScript. Uh, makes it a lot easier to program that way, but that's still something that's, that's you know, catching on, mm -hmm. I think. So, so what about, I mean, for instance, Netflix has done a lot of work to tailor each of their APIs specifically for devices. Um, would, would you do... Would you, would you, what would happen in that situation? How would they build their SDK to fit that pattern? So that, that actually tees up a couple of things. So one, that does make your SDK work a little harder. Mm -hmm. But the other piece of that is that it also starts to get into this idea that we've seen of creating different APIs and different facades mm -hmm. to handle these requirements. There's one of the other reasons that um, you have to think about the device. If you're sending really large SOAP payloads, for example, you're shipping them off to the device, First of all, you know, you're, you're introducing, um, you know, more transmit time, but you're also using more memory, using more processing power. Um, you have to offload some of that burden. Um, or, you know, best case, you're, you're hurting your app developer's ability to create a, the experiences that they need to. And worst case, if, if these developers are external, you know, they just might not adopt your APIs if, if they're that. You know, I mean, we see people select, for example, a payment API based on how mobile friendly it is. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, async, for example, is also one consideration. So in a lot of cases, we talk about this a little more in a couple of the upcoming slides, but, but that's one of the areas where an SDK adds um, a lot of value, which hmm. is to help construct um, you know, background tasks and so on. Sure, the developer can know how to do that, but if the SDK can package it up in a nice way, that can also obviously add a lot of value. Security, obviously, is something that's terrifically important. You mentioned this in, as one of the bullet points earlier. Can you talk about that? Sure. Security has a lot of, of aspects to it, or a lot of things that play into that. Starting point uh, often ends up being identity, because as we said, it's a personalized experience. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we recommend that a lot of these things be based off of uh, an identity set of services that use OAuth, for at least for that authentication piece. You also see um, a lot of folks, uh, particularly for you know retail apps, consumer apps, and so on, that want to use uh, Facebook um, as the sign-in mechanism. Sure. And so, um, what we're starting to see is people design their APIs um, so that they can take a uh, Facebook access token in addition to whatever the native access token would be. And then on the server side, what you do is to make that easier for the developer, you'd handle the token exchange. You know, you take that Facebook token. You call out to Facebook, make sure it's valid, and then issue the app, you know, maybe your own specific access token for subsequent calls. But those are the sorts of considerations where, you know, when you put yourself in the app developer's shoes, you go and say, okay, do I want to make that all happen app side or can I help out a little bit server side? And that also allows you then to put in perhaps some of the auditing and security considerations that you wouldn't have visibility or insight to if you told the app developer, hey, do the whole OAuth flow um, and so on on the device side um, and uh, and handle the, the Facebook integration on the device side. And that's the kind of standard feature that you'd expect to get from backend as a service provider? Very definitely. That is one of the areas where backend services uh, tend to distinguish themselves as a value add. Because when you think about the backend as a service, um, it's not just about going and putting sort of your database in the cloud. You're really trying to add value, particularly in these identity services. and so. So yeah, I mean, I, I would consider that sort of a minimum requirement is that, that there has to be some Facebook sign-in capabilities and ideally integration with other OAuth providers and, uh, and federated identity servers, it's particularly if you're targeting an enterprise. And when you say untrusted device, do you, are you meaning that you, you don't know if, whether or not the device itself is compromised or is this more about the fact that your applications key and secret need to be embedded on the device itself? So, so it can be yes, so it's, it's both, okay. exactly. Um, the, 
you know, untrusted device. So this was one of these things that, so in the early days of Java, they used to talk about browsers untrusted. And, you know, we all came from, from the idea of saying, well, I don't get it. I mean, when, what do you mean it's untrusted? I don't let anybody use my computer. And actually what they're saying is, well, we don't actually trust you as the user either. <laughs> uh, and, and, and what that means is that it's like all this code um, is running outside of your sort of perimeter of trust. And that app, once you shipped it to the user, um, hopefully, you know, they are, uh, you know, a, a good scrupulous user, but they or somebody else might have, you know, taken apart the app. Uh, they will be looking at the network, you know, so it's not just an untrusted device, it's an untrusted network. In fact, one of the popular things that people love to do with, with games and social apps for that matter is to go and uh, use things like uh, man in the middle proxy to go and see, oh, what's this app sending, you know, and, and that's how, you know, some apps were found to be uploading phone books and stuff. So. You know, it basically, if you were just writing one server app talking to another server app, and you know they were all, you know, whatever, you know, at Amazon or somewhere else, the, the yeah, somebody could break into your server to get this stuff. But they, once they start breaking into your server, there was a lot more stuff that was compromised. Mm. Whereas in this case, um, you know, you have to think about any piece of, of the data that's in the device and any piece of data that's being sent by the device. You can only trust the device to the extent you can trust the user, mm. and so that has been a very big problem for API for people using APIs because uh, through through traditional key mechanisms mm -hmm. because you can't just code your keys mm -hmm. into that yeah. and that's where things like go off come from that's where you have to go and uh, either issue user specific access tokens mm -hmm. um, people like Amazon have come up with uh, ideas like token vending mm -hmm. which is a cool way of, of issuing very limited duration tokens coming up with policies and permissions typically tied to the user identity. And honestly, my advice I always give people is, it's gonna be hard to, to provide these API services with some, without some form of, of you know, identified user or a greatly restricted set of guest user functionality. And you see a lot of apps doing this, you know, having sign in and why are they doing that? Even when you go, it's not just for marketing purposes, it's just makes it a lot easier for them to, to you know, identify and secure the data that they send to the device that they let the device access. So, so let me try to summarize. So, it, is it fair to say that you know, I have these backend systems that represent how my business operates, and when I create an API, I'm essentially exposing those services in ways that I expect them to be consumed. It's like opening doors, and, and those doors are specific to applications, and they're specific to people, and how I put the locks on the doors to control access to my services, um, you know, because you know, I need to be careful what is coming in and out of those doors, and that's why secure, that's what, really what we're talking about when we talk about security. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. I mean, there's other security considerations as well, but, but I think those tend to be things that API developers have already been mm -hmm. familiar with. This is where going and targeting mobile trips people up. Or worse, they provide a service that the app developer um, misuses in an insecure way. And then you'll go and say, wait a minute, you did what? You put that access token in the app and now it's out on the app store. You know. So uh, one of the other points you said we'd come back to was asynchronous and off offline. The async experience, um, asynchronous um, and, and offline, these are, these are things that uh, have a lot of, of uh, implications for both sort of the quality of the experience of your app, the functionality of your app, and so on. And so push notifications is one thing that you see has been very powerful within mobile. Um, being able to, so when going back to that, you know, you open up your app 100, 150 times a day. Why are you doing that? Well, often it's because there's a push notification telling you that there's some new data available or something that you should be aware of. You know, you're near your friend at the coffee shop and you should walk over and say hi to them, you know, and that sort of thing. So there's, there's that piece of the experience and how you craft that, which involves sort of how do you do server-initiated connections back to the device. But there's also things like polling, um, which has now been standardized with sort of server-side events, and long polling and so on. Um, and the WebSocket um, is one that, that people often ask me about. Uh, so I love web, WebSocket, it, very cool technology. Um, it's sort of thing that you need to be careful about on a mobile device for, for keeping basically a WebSocket open at long periods of time. There's almost no two ways about it that your battery life is going to decrease significantly mm. when you're using that, uh, particularly if, if you're using it over, um, you know, over, over a cellular network. Mm -hmm. it, it actually works pretty well on Wi-Fi. And in fact, back to your, your question about the Chromecast earlier, mm -hmm. that WebSock is a mechanism by which your, your mobile device goes and talks to the Chromecast, which I thought was really cool. I guess it makes sense in that environment. Yeah, exactly, because it's on the same Wi-Fi network, so it's, it's not going to be the same battery drop.
Network availability. So this is one that's also really key. I mean, basically, Apple will reject your app from the App Store if it can't work in a disconnected fashion, or no, sure. at least notify the user of it in an elegant way. So yeah. if, um, and so that's your app developer's problem to solve, but you're, there are ways you can help from an API standpoint. Um, you can do things like allowing uh, these things to be batched up and sent in a batch mechanism. One example of a way to do that is is through message queues, and people use you know things like Amazon's SQS, and there's other mechanisms, and you know things like within the Apogee backend as a service, we have some queuing message capabilities as well. And that's because you know there are times where you still want to be able to send some data back, um, and still be able to uh, have your server side logic processing that data, maybe sending push notifications back in response. I mean, I guess that, it, of course, it makes sense. If you're moving from the world of you know, desktop machines that are always connected, they, they really don't drop connections, they weren't built that way, to being in this world of mobile where, you know, I took muting here today, right. and I was underground for 20 minutes, and... Yeah, you, you go through three tunnels coming yeah. out of San Francisco. <laughs> and, and true, on the yeah. train, right? Yeah, so, um, well, so... I wouldn't characterize this. To, obviously, it's it's not correct to say that your your laptop never um, drops connections. So it does, sure. but but what I would characterize it is that it's the type of thing where, in the case of, of a connected desktop or certainly server to server, mm -hmm. the uh, your your the percentage of, of calls that are going to fail because of network availability problems is going to be a, hopefully a single digit percentage, mm -hmm. whereas when you're thinking about mobile now, you're thinking sort of a mid to high double digit mm -hmm. type of scenario you have to plan for. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, of course, the last point there um, is that also significant latency. I mean, we see um, plenty of examples of API calls that just don't work for various reasons when the latency goes past uh, a certain length of time. And um, and I think that that tends to be something you don't really test for unless you're going for mobile apps. And then you really actually have to start paying attention for just how long is it taking for the client to get the response. Um, and actually being aware of sort of how long it, the, the client's perspective of when they made the request is different from your perspective when you received the request. Mm. And you can actually see this when you use sort of different types of mobile analytics um, type stuff where, you know, your SDK is sending uh, some, some debugging information. And you'll be like, wow, okay, the app, from the app's perspective, they're 10 seconds into the call. Mm. Um, from your perspective, you just received it. Sure. Uh, and then maybe you're, you know, responding back they're timing out. Right. You see what I'm saying? Like sure. they, they've gone and said, "Well, I, this." So, so how do you help that? Well, sure. they're going and telling you the API isn't responding quick enough, and you don't know. Right. So that's why you start having to think about this. It suddenly becomes your problem, or at the very least, you have to figure out if it really is your problem. Sure. Well, I mean, there's you know, been lots of studies showing how latency I mean, causes customers to disengage from mobile apps. I mean, latency really kills apps. Absolutely. So I, I can appreciate what you're saying. So, for, from the debugging standpoint. Um, this one, I think, is the hardest part for the API developer because, of course, what happens is you can get a very cryptic, you know, set of feedback from mm -hmm. um, from the app developer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's bro it's breaking, authentication isn't working, I'm making calls and things aren't coming back. Skipping to the end, you know, uh, part of the answer is log everything. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, doing device side logging as well, mm -hmm. um, but certainly your uh, server side logging needs to actually dump some more information about the client than maybe you normally would. Hmm. Um, because you start to find things like, well, the OAuth header suddenly disappeared somewhere along the line. Uh, why is that? And it, it could actually be because of the app framework. Remember, there's a lot of code between the app, the, app, for the developer's perspective of the code that they're writing, and what gets sent. Hmm. Because they're using frameworks, they're using uh, you know, toolkits, they're using things like PhoneGap, they're using all this stuff. And those are all being revved completely independently of, mm. of, of stuff you're doing. So they do an update of their app and something stopped working. Mm. And, and it's like, why isn't it working? And in that situation, if you can't very quickly go and say, oh, well, you know what, this header's not being sent anymore. Or conversely, I've seen this one, this was, uh, you know, in one case, a backend service um, updated to actually um, conform exactly to the OAuth spec as, as proper. So they did the right thing. The API team said, let's fix our OAuth implementation. And what happened was the app was um, was doing something incorrect. They were sending old expired access tokens in the header. And um, previous iteration of the backend allowed that, or at least it didn't fail. And, uh, and suddenly the app is breaking. 
you know, and it took a while to figure out what the heck is going on. Sure. So, so that's where you suddenly needed to be able to get into looking at where the problem was, and it was a total hot potato until it got solved. Right. And um, and so there's different mechanisms of of, uh, of solving this stuff. Um, uh, you know, I think if if you're a startup dealing with this stuff, you know, there's people like RunScope that are doing really cool stuff in this regard. Sure. Uh, of course, you know, a good API management platform, yeah. so like Apigee, should give you some tools for getting insights insights into this as well. If you're not using any of those things, I strongly request you really go and look at what you're logging in your API framework. So and, and asking yourself, do I really have all the information here that I would need to uh, jump in and solve uh, one of these problems uh, ahead of time? Because you you'll need to go back a little bit to when, when suddenly you get this you know crazy call from from you know your marketing department or whoever is like our app's not working. It's going to be a needle in the haystack unless you already have uh, you know a bunch of log files of, of collected data to go back and look at. Cool. So. Just to recap, as we start to hit the home stretch here, the story of mobile is the story of APIs that really apps and APIs go together like bread and butter, fish oh. and water. <laughs> and so really, they're two sides of the same coin, uh, and you need to think about that. You know, really, if you think about APIs, you're thinking about it from the perspective of the back-end services, and if you think about apps, you're thinking about it from the perspective of the client. Yeah, I, I think that we've moved past the uh, you know the, the world where you could go and say okay I'm just going to design my API and and you know I'm going to go and do proper RESTful design and all that and and the the apps will just be able to work you know with it because of you know the timeless wonder of, of proper REST design. It, it's now you you now have to go and say okay I got to put myself in the app developer's sh shoes and think a little bit about it. Um, it, particularly if I want my API to be successful. Mm -hmm. well, how do you do that? You know, and so these are some of the ones that, that we think are uh, most important considerations here. So keep in mind that oftentimes all the key app features are cloud connected, mm -hmm. which means if the API doesn't work, key features won't, will stop working. Different types of architecture. So again, the client server type stuff and thinking about this two tier architecture and should you be using something like Node.js stuff to help you know, compose your APIs or mm -hmm. where does API management fit into that? Those are yeah. questions you need to look at. Um, and then just new developments is new pieces of development that you probably weren't worrying about as much. Mm -hmm. uh, SDKs being a big one of them, but also this this you know the network issue for asynchronous push notifications and, and what do you do when things are offline. Mm -hmm. If you have questions, go ahead and put them into the chat. First question is uh, what are the challenges uh, from a version management front uh, when you introduce uh, new SDKs? Mm -hmm. Um, That's a good question. It, it is, and um, so keep in mind that um, the app upgrade cycle, uh, particularly for um, for apps that uh, are in app stores and so on, um, is such that it's hard for the clients to get updated um, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, if anything, uh, version management becomes. Um, even more important because a specific version of the SDK uh, has to often have a specific version of the API continue to be available for the life cycle of that app. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so having a version strategy becomes really important. Mm -hmm. You know, in the past, you know, people including myself go and say, yeah, the version number and that URL is ugly, I'm not gonna do that. But, um, you know, <laughs> you'll really wish you had that when you need to support that old version because you've got a bunch of apps talking to it. So I, I would suggest that that's probably one of the, the main things I would think of from a version standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, Marsh? Yeah, no, it, it makes total sense. I, I think that uh, you know, it's always a challenge to figure out how to keep moving forward without being held back by your legacy, right? Um, you know, whether that's you know, getting off of SOAP and onto something that's more modern or whether it's you know, even iterating on your APIs as you understand you know, it, it always happens. Every you've seen it time and again that the your first chance of getting an API out in the world is going to have things in it you will realize later were wrong, right? And uh, so, you know, having a version strategy at the beginning is really important. And as, as you said, putting it in the URL at least gives you some space uh, to make it obvious to people where they are. Right? Um, but then, you know, some some examples like Twitter is. I, and Flickr both actually have re recently made major changes to their APIs and done, I think, a really good job of helping uh, communicate around what those changes are, how they're going to happen, and then you know slowly throttling them down in a way that people can uh, you know, realize that their apps are breaking and that they've got to 
react. Right. Uh, so there's a question here about any data to support your claim that the use of WebSocket uh, causes battery life issues. Um, what are you comparing this against using long pulling over cellular? Yeah, so let me elaborate a little bit on that. Um, so there's actually a bunch of data out there, um, and, and you know we'll follow up and, and post some of that. But it's not a question about WebSocket in particular, so don't zero in on that and say, oh, you know, we're, we're taking a slam at WebSocket. Uh, what I would suggest is think about, um, uh, think about this as sort of a streaming uh, versus, versus, you know, request um, type of, of challenge. And then, um, you know, the, the example, I, you know, I would look at is consider, you know, uh, I think we certainly, a lot of people have had the experience of if you're using a streaming server over cellular, um, you do seem to see that that um, uh, reduces battery life. Um, I think that the, the, you know, as I said, a bunch of data out there. We'll come up with some examples. Actually, our um, uh, we have some good stuff. Uh, I know uh, Sam Ramsey did, has done a presentation uh, on this uh, subject that I think is out there on SlideShare and, and so on. Um, and we can provide some additional stuff. But really, it's the point that having an open network connection over cellular has a higher cost involved in it. I mean, it, it, it just basic. Uh, it's, it's a basic fact. Um, uh, is long polling better? Well, so first of all, I'm not saying you should never use WebSocket um, or again streaming WebRTC or any of these other any tech technologies. Um, in fact, you know I have a mobile app that uses uh, UDP and have a ton of users using it. Um, and the feedback I get from users is they can use the phone as a hand warmer after um, uh, a short amount of time. That's um, a feature, right? It is a feature, I right. think. Um, but uh, but you know it, you you have to use the trade offs. Um, uh, that you have to consider those trade-offs and, uh, um, and, and design appropriately. Uh, however, if you're using WebSocket to do particularly sort of small chunks of data um, that are you know, not being sent in sort of a high velocity format, then maybe WebSocket isn't the way to do it. Maybe actually long polling, where you have the ability to tell the device to throttle the amount of polling, or the device, the app itself, has the option to throttle the polling. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes the user won't necessarily know that, for, for example, if it's a chat app that the new message, you know, took, took, you know, appeared within one second of when the other person sent it or 10 seconds. And doing that and timing that can actually have some battery improvement. Mm -hmm. um, or f frankly, stretching it out. Whereas do I have to have this open connection, you know, uh, continuous. Sure. But again, I'm sure somebody will come back and they'll give some exact you know, find situations where the exact converse is true and WebSocket saves battery life. So yeah, always, I mean, really, it comes <laughs> always use the right tool for the job, right? right. And sometimes you, you need to have that long connection, sometimes you don't. Right. Where does Apogee help here, both in the apps and server infrastructure, and also asking for uh, recommended, I saw one in here, oh, it seems to have disappeared. Nope, we'll start with that. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, of course, you know, um, Apogee does have, uh, uh, a bunch of, uh, of developer tools for helping with uh, the infrastructure and for enterprise customers. That's primarily the business that we're in is for people who want to deploy these things, you know, at scale within enterprise settings. Um, and, you know, going and checking out um, uh, our, our website and going to uh, the developer section will provide a, a bunch of data. Um, and a bunch of or a bunch of information and content that's that's worth taking a look at. Well, and that's why we do things like this webinars because we see these issues over and over again from our position in you know, in how this revolution is happening. And so, you know, as we gather that information, we're trying to share that out to people. Um, but I mean, I think that, that just to restate what you were saying a different way, that you know, as we as we were saying, the whole theme of this presentation has been that app, the story of apps is the story of APIs. And that really thinking about it from the perspective of the server or the client is, you know, we, we intend to solve problems on both ends of that. Right. Question about whether Apogee provides a Node.js capability via the dashboard or on roadmap to run my own code and integrate it with third-party services. Uh, uh, stay tuned. Um, which it, that's an area where we're doing different, some interesting things. Um, it's, uh, it's uh, we're seeing, I think, it's really interesting the level of Node.js uh, adoption that we're seeing out there, and um, uh, you know, I think any company that's looking to help people, uh, you know, build uh, APIs in this type of setting is asking themselves, hey, where does Node.js fit in our plans? Hmm. Stay tuned. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, here, here's another, considering the app is offline, what's the best way of handling data from the API? Stop the app if no network connectivity or store in persistent storage? So the, the cop out on this is going to say it depends um, <laughs> on, on that. Um, those are both, um, so those are both viable um, uh, strategies depending on what the experience that you want to provide is. There are going to be some apps that um, that it's just not going to, it's not going to work mm -hmm. by going and, and um, you know, the flow of data is just inherently two-way and, uh, and being offline is going to, it's going to stop the experience. Um, and so in those cases, your, op your, your options are to notify the, the, the user, and that's really what the Apple guidelines, for example, are saying. They're not saying mm -hmm. you can't work disconnected, obviously, they disqualify a ton of apps on that. What they're saying is you can't just be like, Users typing stuff and they have no idea what's going on, and, and the app is doing strange stuff. You got to go and say, okay, you know, um, you know, network connectivity has been lost, um, you know, and then then, then the, the, what you do depends on your app. You either go and say, uh, you know, you should close your app now, or conversely, maybe you could fall back to a offline mode. Maybe it's a chat app, sure. and you go and say, you know, offline. New messages you send will be queued and sent later. Hopefully, in sort of a more elegant way than I just said it. But sure, uh, no, no, no. Yeah. What you were saying is that thinking about perspective, what's going to be good for your user? Right. What's the right user experience when you lose network connectivity? Exactly. It's basically thinking about what the failure condition is and planning for it. Yeah. Good. What's the best relationship among API SDK and IDE? What's the best relationship between API SDK and IDE? That's a so that's a, that's interesting. Um, what is the best relationship? So there are some folks that are coming out there um, with sort of an integrated IDE um, uh, SDK experience. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think folks like um, uh, you know, I think I think folks like Accelerator and I think maybe Tigzy um, and uh, and Trigger.io they take some variants of that. Um, that works um, if it, if it works for your productivity. Um, uh, then you know definitely give it give it a shot um, for other folks um, particularly if you're doing native code um, you know if you're doing native code on the iPhone you're using Xcode as your IDE um, and uh, and your SDK is going to be something that you have to bundle in um, and, uh, and 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 API's are going to be the ones you choose to use would we recommend creating dedicated API's for mobile apps in cases where the front end of a web app is tightly coupled with the back end API making it useless for mobile apps uh, I think that actually sort of the, the question answers itself. Uh, if you need to create a mobile app um, and you've got a tightly coupled uh, uh, front end to back end, then you actually really have two options. Um, the one we would recommend would be creating the dedicated APIs. Uh, I do. I have seen some folks be successful in building sort of screen scrape front ends where they, you know, sort of. Uh, somehow we leverage their web UI and, and turn it into APIs, but but generally you, you need to create um, a dedicated API. What consideration should be taken with regard to payload size and handshakes considering latency and data limits on mobile, mobile devices? It would be great to have some specific um, guidelines on that. Maybe in a follow-up one we can have mm. some of the guys on the mobile analytics team that have spent That's a ton idea. of time digging into the specifics of the data on that. Um, and actually just to, to go a little further on that, uh, there are um, there are some good tools, um, Apogee Mobile Analytics that I just mentioned, but also to, to point out some of the other ones out there, um, some of the stuff that uh, that Criticism and some other guys do lets you get um, uh, you know a little bit of, of debugging data, so you can start to actually uh, tune for that. Um, is there sort of a, a hard and fast? Don't make it bigger than 5K. Um, I, I wouldn't be prepared to give an exact you know. Uh, Obviously, smaller is better. Less data is better. Um, uh, have some considerations to, um, you know, a very dense XML payload um, is a lot harder to parse um, and, and query through, um, and, and it's going to have more performance overhead for your app. Just basic types of, of well, but also on the flip side, like bundling API calls so that you can do get it in one. Uh, that's a that's a great win. For performance, that tends to be a very big one, um, which is to to do some level of, of API orchestration where you're you're combining um, sort of fine grained APIs into a it's sort of a larger coarse grained one. Yep. Another question: What are the no nos of token vending or identifying a user with mobile characteristics? So, I mean, I can think of one easy one off the bat, which is uh, don't do something that's like OAuth but not OAuth. 
That's I think that's a best practice. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's one of those ones where, where yeah. Um, there, there are situations where you might want to do that, but I, I, I wouldn't recommend them. I think I think more from a security no no though is the basic thing is, um, you know, the app you. There can't be any way that your app via an API call uh, can get at any data, touch any data, make any changes to any data, do anything that the user identified with the app is not empowered to do. Now, what does that mean when you come in and token vending and so on? Um, it means that um, you have to uh, narrow the set of capabilities that you're exposing via the API uh, such that um, if you're using token vending or what have you, that, that they be the types of things you would let an anonymous user um, use um, on, on the website. You may end up needing to take a cue from, um, you, may, you may want to expire things quickly, you may want to require a uh, uh, re-registration at times. Um, uh, you know, obviously there's going to be big trade-offs as to um, um, you know, usability versus security in this regards. Um, which is one of the reasons why you end up having to create sort of a separate set of API facades, because there are definitely going to be a reduced set of capabilities that you want to expose via APIs for for um, for mobile app use than maybe you're currently doing for trusted partners. What is the best way of having an endpoint responding differently based on the role of the user? So this is actually um, this is actually a really um, common implementation question it comes up on on API Craft and other places. Um, and there, actually, there's we can have a whole conversation uh, <laughs> on that one. Um, you know, it, it's uh, there, there, there's a couple of different schools of thought. Um, one of the things you see on a lot of APIs, um, Facebook, I think, might have been one of the first ones to do I think this. They pioneered it. Uh, I think they pioneered it. Um, I, I know when our back end of service stuff offers this uh, option, which is you're able to go and say, for example, if I want to get the friends of of the user. Is it users slash me slash friends, or is it users slash marsh slash friends? Right. Um, that might so sound like a subtle difference, but it actually has a lot of implications. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the former case, users slash me slash friends, I have to take that access token, um, and that access token has to be strongly tied to the identity. Mm -hmm. um, and it has to be able to go in and say, okay, you know, uh, uh, in this context, me is marsh, mm -hmm. right? Um, in the latter case, you can start to actually do some, um, I mean, it's easier to protect your APIs at sort of the framework level um, or at the API management level. And so, um, as I said, it's a very long conversation. Um, I could go into a lot more depth on it. Yeah, but I think the short answer is good, is that, you know, slash me is a great pattern, you should look at it. Yes. Going mobile first doesn't okay. hinder development given the ecosystem for developing mobile apps isn't as mature as traditional web technologies. Is that a question? Um, doesn't going mobile first hinder development? Maybe? Um, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment. Personally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the form of a question, I think it, it depends on what the purpose of your APIs are. There's a lot of APIs that um, uh, people have exposed. Um, you know, we work with a lot of carriers, and a lot of those APIs that they've exposed um, have a ton more value mm -hmm. in, in mobile context where they're location based and so on. Um, and maybe they would have gotten. Um, uh, you know, more adoption, you know, maybe they get, I uh, definitely think they get more adoption now. Certainly if you were doing a Geo API five years ago um, versus uh, where, where mobile first was sort of a, an early concept mm -hmm. versus now, um, you, you know, you'd, you'd have a lot more traction. How do you balance clean and easy to understand API with fast to run code uh, or functions built for a specific purpose? So I, I think this speaks to, you know, as you begin to have specialized cases, so I think Netflix is a good example, for instance, um, as you begin to specialize your API for specific purposes, and it starts to blow out the service area of your API, and that makes it harder to understand. So right, and this gets into the API composition problem. There's a lot of different solutions to this. Um, uh, Netflix, and I, I think we, we addressed this in, in the previous webinar we did, but, but you see some folks like Netflix that go and build sort of a very rich, facade com combination layer that sort of combines these APIs for, for specific functional requests um, so that they, they, can, they can drive that. Um, some people use things like Node.js to do that, where they have their internal APIs coming out of their Java application server and then they 
they use you know quickly created Node.js code to create the spe specific functionality. And then of course, API management, part of the reason why I use API management is for that. So if you're using a product like Apogee, we have obviously, you know, one of the reasons why people use our stuff is to be able to manage, you know, 900 variations of their API for those types of purposes. Do you suggest hypermedia API design for new startup apps, or does it create more of a headache trying to teach API users how to use your services? Uh, you <laughs> picked this one for last because we need to run for the door after we answer this. <laughs> That's right. Um, and, Look, uh, I, I think hi, my position on hypermedia may be different from yours. My position on hypermedia, hypermedia is that as long as you're making things easier for developers, hypermedia is a great option. But I don't think that uh, I, I don't buy into the everything has to be hypermedia and driven off the root. Um, I don't think that's really helping developers uh, it, necessarily. There, there's some good reasons for it, and if you've got architecture, if your long-term plan involves having clients uh, you know, depend on the server for state, um, I think that's fine. Uh, I think developers still aren't used to that a whole lot. Um, so uh, I, I don't think hypermedia is a, is a, it's certainly not a panacea. Uh, it, it's good, but I, I tend to prefer it where it makes sense. Like I think paging is a great example. Paging is a place where you shouldn't have to know how to use the counter, you should just get a link back telling you what the next page is. Yeah, I, I do think that, I, I think that that's uh, a very good example for that. Um, I do think that, um, so, this is one where you can come at it from your architect hat or your app developer hat. <laughs> um, uh, and, and you can start to get into some religion and, well, you should do this, you ought to do that. I, I will say from a pragmatic standpoint, um, for a lot of the sort of commercial uses of APIs, um, the app developer uh, cannot impose the type of user experience that a hypermedia API expects to be able to drive into that layer. Meaning that, um, that, that you know, sort of starting it at the index and, and traversing and so on will not let them build the experience. Sure. That, that, that is being, that's being asked for them by, by other groups. So you can say, well, that's not the way it should be, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just saying the app developer will not be able to use your API. Sure. They, their constraints, uh, you know, uh, put upon them in terms of what the experience they have to drive would just not make the API work. Um, so in that sort of situation, if you're really going to say, okay, hypermedia API, you're really basically, um, folk, you're, among other things, you're forcing the app developer to probably use a mobile web to, to create a mobile web API. And that's, again, not going to meet certain requirements that are sort of outside of, I think, the architectural purview. So, so, so I think the answer, to go back to the question, do you suggest hypermedia API design for new startup apps? I think the answer is no. I mean, use, you, we don't suggest that you use it. We, if, you, if that makes sense to you, if that's the direction you want to take, I think having a point of view is more important here. We don't think you, you need to have it, though. I think the lean development process is going to be that a lot of startups and honestly a lot of development activities that we see, uh, even you know, among the enterprises, uh, is going to emphasize things that are not necessarily going to allow mm -hmm. play to the strengths of hypermedia APIs as a way to, to you know, put it. What are the advantages of using app services for app development over using native SDKs? So by app services, I, I, I think the question of using, um, uh, doing things maybe on the, so I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. I, I, I'll take a stab at saying, should, do I, should I be doing strong things like natively on the device versus say storing them on the cloud. Um, I think from that facet, uh, people are now using multiple devices um, and uh, you know, they have iPads and they have iPhones and being able to move that experience from one versus the other means that if you're storing the data locally in your, your SQL light on, on the iPhone, for example, um, you know, that might not be the best thing to do. Uh, if the question is, um, uh, should I use an SDK versus um, you know an SDK that's talking to an API versus you know an API directly. I think we covered that piece, which is that it really depends on to what extent uh, you want to accelerate your developer's productivity. I don't. I don't. I think we're at a point right now where we don't consider um, at one time where people were creating SDKs that had some crazy binary protocol or something in the background that was proprietary. Right. Um, I, I, you know, in those days we used to say don't you know do an API, don't do an SDK. Um, now we go and say do an API and an SDK. Cool. Good. Thanks everyone for attending. Again, we'll post this, uh, the video and audio and the slides to our various channels. Um, and thanks for attending. See you next time.